So, all right. So, let's continue our construction of finite fields. We've been talking about minimal polynomials. Okay. So, I wrote down uh, several uh, interesting properties. So let me just write down the definition here. Suppose somebody gives you a, an element of finite field with t power m elements. What is the minimal polynomial? Is a polynomial belonging to the finite field with just p elements. Okay, such so that there are uh, two things that are needed. M beta of beta should be zero, and then what degree is minimal, right? So we wrote down a few properties last time. I think they didn't highlight probably one of the, the most important property, and I didn't. I did not even uh, mention a few other important properties. So let me let me do that a little bit more carefully. So this is the first thing. The first property, which is quite important, which I think we missed out last time. I am not sure if I mentioned this property. The first property is that uh, m beta of x has to be reduced. Okay. It's a bit obvious, but still. It's important to write it down as a property. Okay. Why should it be uh, reducible? Okay, how do you prove this? Yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. So you always assume the opposite statement and come up with the contradiction. Suppose you say it is reducible. Okay. Then what should happen? M beta of x should be able to be, you should be able to write it as some a of x times b of x. Both of them have degrees strictly less than the degree of m beta of x. Now you put x equals beta and that. Then on the left hand side you get 0, on the right hand side should also. There should be at least one of those polynomials should have beta as the root and that has strictly lesser degree and that gives you a contradiction. Okay, so that is the idea here. Okay, so again proof is by contradiction. Okay, so you assume m beta of x equals some o of x times b of x where degree of o of x and degree of b of x are strictly lesser than degree of m beta of x. Okay? Now you see beta has to be a root of either a of x and b of x and that gives a contradiction. Contradict, it contradicts the minimality of the degree of m beta that we assume. Okay. okay, so that is the end of the proof. So that is the first thing. And another property that we saw, I mentioned it, but I did not quite complete the property. Okay, so I said if you have an f of x in zpx and that's what f of beta is 0, then what happens? m beta of x should divide f of x. Okay, so what's important about this property is a kind of a corollary. And this corollary is quite important. So we already know a polynomial in Zpx for which every beta and fpm will be a root. Okay, what is that polynomial? Okay, so you can take f of x to be x power p power m minus x. What do we know about this polynomial? F of beta, we know f of beta is 0, right? Okay, so that implies the minimal polynomial of any element of this finite field with with p power m elements has to divide x star p power m minus x. Okay, so that's another. This corollary is quite important. We use it 
quite expensive. Okay. So let me ask you a couple of uh, interesting questions based on these results that we have seen. So we see that if you have an element of a finite field and if you have a minimal polynomial for it with coefficients from Zp, then it is the minimal polynomial is irreducible. What about kind of a converse for this statement? Suppose I say there is an irreducible polynomial over Zpx and for that polynomial I know that beta is the root beta in Fpm, Fp per m. I know it's the root for some irreducible polynomial. Will that mean that be the minimal polynomial for beta? Can I immediately say that that will be the minimal polynomial? Sorry? Okay, so suppose I say suppose I say there is some irreducible polynomial in Zpx for which beta is a root. Okay. Does it mean that be, that polynomial is the minimal polynomial for beta? It has to be true, right? So that converse also has to be true. It's kind of very because beta is a root for this irreducible polynomial. If you had a minimal polynomial for beta, what should happen? That should divide this. And the only way that polynomial can divide this is if it's itself. So that's the definition of irreducible. Okay, so that's also true. So converse for here is also true. Okay. If at any point in time you come across an irreducible polynomial for which you know that beta is the root, right, then you know that that has to be the minimal polynomial. Yes, that much is also. Okay, so likewise here there is kind of like a converse for this. So we know that if you have an element in your field and if you have a minimal polynomial for it, that minimal polynomial divides x bar p bar m minus x. Remember, this is an irreducible polynomial. Okay. Suppose now I give you another irreducible polynomial which is a factor of x bar p bar m minus x. Okay, suppose there is an irreducible polynomial which is a factor of x bar p bar m minus 1. I am doing kind of the reverse of this, right? So I found the minimal polynomial and now I know that it divides this, but let us do the reverse. Let us start with this x bar p bar m minus x, find an irreducible polynomial which is a factor of that, okay? Is it true that there is an element in the field for which that is a minimal polynomial? Okay, so these converses are quite important in understanding the structure of the field. Okay, so that's why I'm kind of trying to beat this out. So think about it. Suppose I now factor this x bar p bar m minus x in some crazy way. Somebody gives me a factoring algorithm, and maybe I factor it. I find an irreducible polynomial with coefficients from Zp. Okay, that also is there. Now, do I know that there will be an element in the finite field of p bar m for which this will be the irreducible? This will be the minimal polynomial. Can I say that? Okay. Will there be an element in this finite field which will be a root of this the irreducible polynomial that I found? Okay. It has to be true. Remember, why? What happens to x bar p bar m minus x? It factors into linear factors over f p bar m. So, over f p bar m, you can write it as x minus something times x minus something times x minus something. Somebody else gives you an algorithm which factors it and gives you a factor over z p x. Okay. Now, that also has to respect this factorization, which means this irreducible polynomial has to have some element of the finite field as a root okay, and that tells you that it has to be a minimal polynomial. Okay, so, that, so there is some kind of a link here between irreducible polynomials x bar p bar m minus x and elements of the finite field. Okay, so that, that, that link is very strong, okay, it is not a very loose link and you can go from one and one to the other back and forth very easily. Okay. So that really ties down the field and its constructions and polynomials in some very nice way. Okay. So that is what we are going to explore, we will start by examples and then we will slowly see some interesting nice uh, final constructions which give you a lot of uh, okay so think about that for a while that's it's important to know that uh, the strong relationship between irreducible polynomials finite field elements factors of x bar p bar and minus x and all that okay all right so let's see a couple of examples okay, we'll begin with really simple examples we'll begin with uh, f say f2 okay. the example Zero one. Okay. So first example I'm going to give. So what do I want to check? If it's f two, I want to see how x squared minus x. Then x squared minus x in f two is what? Same as x squared plus x squared. So that's going to factor very easily as x times x plus one, and that's what you expected. Okay. So in f two, it's it's quite trivial. Factorization is there's nothing much to look at in terms of minimal polynomials. So this is a minimal polynomial of zero. And this is a minimal polynomial of 1. Okay. Right? Both are irreducible. So all these things are very trivial. There is nothing much to do with it. 
सकते हैं नेक्स्ट एग्जाम्पल में भी मिलते मिनिमल This is a minimal polynomial of one. This is a minimal polynomial of. So okay, check this factorization. You, you need to be careful when you check this factorization. Remember, we are working in F3, so it's, it's a bit more trivial. A bit, bit non-trivial. So let's look at F5. Just for uh, completing the story. Okay, zero, one, two, three, four. Then what should happen to X bar five minus one minus x? Has to be x times. So, so try, let's try to factor it in a little bit different way. Okay, so x times x plus four minus one. So, what's x plus four minus one? X squared minus one times x squared plus one. Am I right? Okay, in any field, this is true, right? X squared minus b squared. You learn all these formulas from from a young age. But it's true in any field, right? It's a polynomial identity. Okay, so x plus four minus one is x squared minus one times x squared plus one. And then what do you do? You have to factor these things further. So, so what about which of the elements is square to give you one? Okay. Four and one, right? So this will be the factor as x minus one times x minus four, and this has to be the other two, so x minus two times x minus three. Okay. So you can nicely factor that way. Then it gives you another way of thinking about how this polynomial has to factor. So you know the final answer has to be that way. But then, how to get to it is an interesting, interesting kind of uh, kind of idea. Okay, so it's not really okay. So in F five, some crazy things like this happen. Okay, so let's go to F four, which is of more interest to us. And I will use my polynomial construction for F four, which is zero one alpha one plus alpha and alpha squared. Okay, so remember it's mod two, right? Mod two addition. Okay, two zero. Okay. So now let's do x power four minus x. Okay, so here the factoring will become a little bit more interesting. Okay. So let's try what I did before. Let's let me pull x out. So that's the first thing you can do. It's very easy. Get x power three minus one. Then what do you do with a power three minus b power three? So okay, it's also plus, right? So the plus and minus are the same, and so it's two is zero. Okay, so a power three plus b power three, we can again do a plus b, and then right. So I have already identified m zero of x. I have already identified m one of x. So what has to happen with x squared plus x plus one? It has to be X plus alpha times x plus one plus alpha. So remember, this is also alpha squared, which is just an easier notation for me. So this has to work out as x plus one, and this has to be x plus alpha times x plus alpha squared. So this is basically the minimal polynomial of alpha. It's also the minimal polynomial of alpha squared. Okay, which is not surprising. We saw all the properties. Then F4 alpha and alpha squared has to have the same minimal polynomial. Right? So we, we saw that this property. Right? If you do alpha part p, you don't get a different minimal polynomial. You get the same minimal polynomial. Okay. So you've observed one interesting thing, right? We constructed this F4 with the reducible polynomial x squared plus x plus one. Okay. And what happens in F4? X squared plus x plus one nicely factors into linear terms. Okay. So x squared plus x plus one has no roots in F two, 
that it has roots in F4. Not only that, it has all its roots in F4. Okay, so all the roots you might want are in F4. Okay, so such nice properties are true with polynomials in general over finite fields. Okay, so any polynomial you can find the large enough field in which to factor into linear terms. Okay, so that's a nice, uh, nice result to have. Okay, so that's the F4, and uh, let's do a few more examples like this, maybe a little bit differently, just to give you a feel for how this might work. Okay, so so let me take F8. Uh, okay, so you might be a little bit uncomfortable with this. I'll just pull out the final answer very very quickly, and we'll see how it works. Okay, so I'll take F8 as The other thing that's true here is alpha plus 3 is not going to matter. Alpha plus 7 is 1, and we'll take alpha plus 3 to be alpha squared plus 1. Alpha plus 1. Okay, okay so this is a this is a final thing. So remember how, how am I constructing this? I'm using basically power of x to be power of alpha to be alpha plus 3 plus alpha plus 1. Okay. All right, and I know. So remember, what is F8? F8 is set of all polynomials in alpha of degree less than or equal to two. Okay, so I can write it out that way. But I know that there is a primitive element in this field, and I know that in that field, alpha is a primitive element. Okay, so I construct like that. Alpha itself will be a primitive element. Okay, so I know that also. So I know that this will be. True. Okay, so if you don't believe me, you can try this. Okay, zero, one, alpha, alpha square. What is alpha part three? Alpha plus one. What is alpha plus four? Alpha square plus alpha. What is alpha plus five? Alpha square plus alpha plus one. What is alpha plus six? Alpha square plus one. And then alpha plus seven will be one. Okay. So you see, and that gives you all the fields, all the field elements. So alpha indeed is a primitive element. If I do this. Okay. So this is this is something uh, that's true in a field. Okay. So now let's try to look at x bar 8 plus x and see how it works out. Okay, so factoring is a little bit more painful here. So, so usually you have to do it in, in some other way. Okay, so so we'll see. Okay, so for my properties, I know the minimal polynomials are easy to guess now. So, so for zero, what is m zero of x? X itself. What is m one x? X plus one. Okay, so these two things are the easiest to write down. Now I'm now I have all these alphas to deal with, right? But what do I know? I know alpha, alpha squared, and alpha power four. They are all roots of the minimal polynomial of of alpha, right? If I have a minimal polynomial of alpha, right? I'll have some minimal polynomial of alpha. I know that alpha, alpha squared, and alpha power four are all roots of the minimal polynomial. So let's try this exercise. Okay, so it will seem like a full hardy exercise to you. You see, at the end of it, you will get something interesting. Okay, I know that this product has to divide the minimal polynomial of alpha, right? I know that. So let's try this: x plus alpha times x plus alpha squared times x plus alpha power four. Okay, so let me see. Okay, so you have remember alpha power. So we have the table from before. No? So let me just go back there, copy it, and paste it in this page. Okay, so that's the table. So we do this. We have x squared plus alpha plus alpha square. What's alpha plus alpha square? Alpha plus four, right? And then alpha plus three times x plus alpha plus four. Okay, and then let's multiply this out. We have x plus three plus then what? Alpha plus four plus alpha plus four. So that will go away, right? And then the x term is going to be. Alpha power eight plus alpha power three. What is alpha power eight? The same as alpha. So alpha plus alpha power three. What is alpha plus alpha power three? One. One. Okay. So we just have x. And then what's the constant term? Alpha power three times alpha power four, which is alpha power seven, which is one. Okay. So that's is that great or not? That's a great result. Why is that a great result? I found the minimal polynomial for alpha. 
Okay, see so x plus alpha times x plus alpha square times x plus alpha power 4 has to divide the minimal polynomial of alpha. I know that. Okay, so it has to be like that. But then what happens to the product itself? That itself belongs to belongs to what? Z2x. It okay, has coefficients only 0 and 1, and then I know that that is irreducible also. So clearly this has to be equal to the minimal polynomial of alpha, which is also equal to minimal polynomial of alpha squared is also equal to the minimal polynomial of alpha plus 4. Okay. So like this, if you look at the other elements, okay, what are the other elements? Just remaining here, alpha, alpha square and alpha plus 4 are done. So if you look at alpha plus 3, alpha plus 3, alpha plus 6 and then alpha plus 4, alpha plus 5, they are all conjugates. Right? They all have the same minimal polynomial. Okay. So if you do that multiplication also, Okay, so it's a bit of work, so I'm not going to do it for you. But if you do that, you will see you'll get x bar three plus x bar plus one. Okay, and that will be the minimal polynomial of alpha bar three. It will also be the minimal polynomial of alpha bar six. It will also be the minimal polynomial of alpha. Okay, so that's the nice thing about. Uh, Okay. So, so that's the thing. So what will happen is, if you take x bar 8 plus x and then you factor it, you will get, you will get what, x times x plus 1 times x plus alpha, so until x plus alpha plus 6. So now, if I want to factor this, if you want to get rid of the alphas, so to speak. Okay, so this factoring is nice, but then there is alpha. Okay, so maybe I don't want alpha. How do I do that? Okay, so all I have to do with grouping, right? So I group the x plus alpha term, x plus alpha square term, x plus alpha plus 4 term. What will I get? I will get x star 3 plus x plus 1. Okay, and then I group the remaining terms. I will get x star 3 plus x star plus 1. So that gives me the complete factoring of x bar 8 plus x in uh, over z2 itself. Okay. So, so, so I mean, there's, there's lots of results which we didn't prove. We just used here, and these things are generally true also in general. But we'll come to that later. But for now, this is a this is a good recipe we have for finding. Uh, okay. So if you go to larger fields, doing this is a bit more messy. So. So I'm going to stop. Uh, maybe I'll give you an example with F16, and then we'll stop. Okay, so I think this is example five. So we'll see F16. I'll quickly give you the final answer. We'll avoid all the calculations. I know that this is like this. So F16 is one. I'll put F4 is I'll put this. Okay. So here, if you see X plus 16 plus X, we'll factor like this. Okay, so x times x plus 1. I will give you the final answer for now and then later on we will see how to prove this. Okay. x plus 1, you will have x bar plus x plus 1. And then you will have x bar 4 plus x plus 1. You will have x bar 4 plus x bar 3 plus 1. You will have x bar 4 plus x bar 3 plus x bar 3. Okay, so this is how we factor. So that's an astonishing result, which is true. And you might have seen the previous two, previous two factorings. There is some one common connection between the two, which is truly an astonishing result. If you haven't seen it before, it turns out when you factor x bar p bar m plus x, you will get every irreducible polynomial in Zpx whose degree divides m. You will get that as the factor. Okay, so that is the general rule here. We will prove that it's not too hard to prove, but it's it's quite surprising. Okay, so when you know when you see it, it's, it's the power of these polynomials. That's why these things are all quite strongly linked. Okay, so when you do x bar p bar m plus x in general, and you factor it into terms like this, okay, into terms in z p x only, turns out every irreducible polynomial whose degree divides them will show up as a factor. So you see here, this is x bar. 2 power 4 plus x, right? Okay. So every irreducible polynomial, every binary irreducible polynomial 
whose degree divides 4. What, what does it mean to say degree divides 4? Degree can be 1, 2 or 4. Every irreducible polynomial will show up as a factor. And those will be exactly the factors. There will be nothing. It's quite a surprising result. So you go back and see for x power 8 plus x, this is what x power 2 power 3 plus x, right? Every irreducible polynomial whose degree divides 3, what is that? 1 and 3 has shown up here. Binary irreducible polynomial. Okay. So it's a powerful result which ties, ties up these polynomials together with the finite fields. And the way you, the finite field comes in nicely to tie up everything together. Okay, so we are going to try and prove some of these things and uh, some of the ideas may be a little abstract but I think it is quite important to get to the bottom of it to see the see how all these things are related. It is a very nice, uh, very nice way of seeing it. So, so let us do that. Okay. So the first thing we are going to see is, uh, is the following result. Okay, so, so, so let me say the title for the few let me say a few abstract results is what we are going to see next. And these are this may not help you directly in the in terms of error control codes, but I think it's good to see them once just for just to know what they are and to get a feel for how these things work in, in algebra. Okay. So the first result we see is this interesting guy. Suppose F is a extension of ZP. Okay, some finite extension. Okay, so, F is a finite field which is an extension of FP. What do you mean by extension of ZP? It contains ZP as a subfield, the proper subfield. Okay, so that is the that's an extension of, of ZP. Okay, so let us let's just say it that way. Okay. So, so let us say it is an extension of ZP uh, that contains all roots of. P power n minus x. Okay. So it contains all the roots of this. Okay. So what do we mean by all the roots of this? How many roots does it have? As P power m roots. Okay. Counting multiplicities, it has P power m roots. Okay. So then it turns out then the the roots of the roots of x power p power m minus x from the field, a field, basically form, uh, form let's say FP power m. Okay, basically they form a field with P power m elements. Okay, the roots form a field with P power m elements, and of course, and, uh, and uh, obviously this FP power m is contained in. So this is, uh, this is really true. I don't have to really say. It. So obviously it contains all the roots of it, so all these roots are in there, so it contains the, the proper field. Okay. So there are a lot of things to prove if you want to claim this result. The first thing you have to show is the uh, no two roots of x power p power m minus x can repeat. Okay. So x power p power m minus x cannot have repeated roots. Okay. So there is a way to show this, I am going to skip that. Okay. So that is a proof that we will assume. So the way you show it is you have to formally define the derivative. Okay. So you can define the derivative of polynomials. Whenever you have and uh, there will be a product rule for the derivative, right? So uh, f of x times g of x has a product rule, and the same thing will be holding for polynomials. I know there is no calculus here, but you can formally derive, uh, define derivatives. What is formal definition? So say x bar n derivative is n times x bar n minus 1. That is clearly well defined, there is no problem. You define formally, and then it turns out if the polynomial has repeated roots, then that root is also a root of the derivative, okay. So you use that idea and show that this polynomial and its derivative are relatively prime in any field. You can show that it's not very prime. So, so once you show that, it cannot have repeated roots. So once this z f has all the roots of x bar p bar m minus x, it has all the roots of x bar p bar m minus x. Okay, so that's the first step, and we'll assume it. Okay, the next step is this guy: the roots of x bar p bar m form a field with p bar m elements. Okay, so this you have to prove by the field axioms. Okay, so so this means the first step we assumed. So we we'll say roots of x bar p bar m minus x in f are basically you know zero is the root, you know one is the root, right? So all these things you know already, and then maybe there are other roots. So this will be, or maybe I don't need to even qualify this. So, okay, so let, let me just say that alpha one, alpha two, for example, 
alpha bar p bar n minus two. Okay, so so you can argue that the zero of f will be a root of this. You can also argue that the one of f will be a root of that. Okay, so other than that, it will have p bar n minus two, and they'll all be distant. Okay, so now we have to just show axiom after axiom for the field. Okay, so what what do you need for the fields? If you have any two roots here, alpha i plus alpha j is also a root. Okay, so somebody just a uh, better notation is to say alpha one is zero, alpha two is one, and then go from three four onwards. Okay, so I think that's a better notation. All the way to the power. Okay, so now I have to show alpha i plus alpha j. Is also a root, so that's easy to show. Right? Alpha i plus alpha j goes to the power p power n. Okay, minus alpha i plus alpha j. Right? What will this be? So I know this is a field of characteristic p, right? It contains that p, so it's a characteristic p field. So what will be alpha i plus alpha j goes to the power p power n? If you alpha i power p power n plus alpha j power p power n, and then we are subtracting this, and this is clearly zero. Okay, so the addition is satisfied. Okay. So you take any two roots of this guy and then add them up. You will also get the root of x bar p bar m minus x n f. Okay, so we are inside this field. You are not you are not going to go away outside of this set. So the closure for addition is satisfied. Similarly, the closure for multiplication will also be satisfied. It's not very hard to show. Okay, once again, you just use the same idea. You so raise the copy each of them, raise the copy each of them again. We replace by alpha i alpha j. Okay, so in this also you can show in the same way. So all these things are not very hard. So you just show. Closure for addition, closure for multiplication, and in inverse, and uh, for both. Okay, just based on these properties, you can show. All right. Think about. I mean, inverse might be a little bit more twisted. You'll have to show for each element alpha i, alpha i raised to the power alpha i squared, alpha i power three. All of those things will also be roots. Okay, and then eventually it has to repeat. And then when it repeats, there will be an inverse. Okay, so that's how you show the inverse. Okay, so this is closure for addition. You show similarly closure for multiplication. In verse, okay. So there is some work involved there, but it's not very hard. You can show that, and this is this, this can be done. Okay. So that's that's the that's the first result we have about a more abstract result. In any extension field, if you have roots for x bar p bar m minus x, okay, and then that that f p m itself will be inside them. Okay. So this is the first result uh, that we're going to use. We'll keep that aside. Okay. So we'll we'll just remember this. Is x bar p bar m minus x. So, so this is kind of like a converse, you know. So the way to think about it is, if you have a field with p bar m elements, the linear factors of x bar p bar m minus x are there in that field. The converse kind of thing is also true in any field. If x bar p bar m minus x factors, those factors, those linear terms, those roots form the field of p bar. Okay, so that is also true. Both those. Okay. Right. So the next result is uh, uh, so. So the next result is the following. But, uh, to think about how I want to phrase this so that it's uh, so that it's easy to uh, uh, okay. So let me do a more more definite result. Okay, so this is kind of like a property of uh, primitive polynomials. Of minimal polynomials. So let me say. Okay, so this is an interesting property of minimal polynomials, and here we we'll use the result. We we'll use a proof technique, which will give you an idea of how many of these proofs are going to work. Okay, so so let me use the, the property. Okay, so the property is as follows. Suppose beta belonging to F P R M is primitive. Okay, so what do we mean by primitive? It generates the entire f p par m in multiplicative fashion. Its order is p par m minus one. Okay, so it's primitive. Then degree of m beta of x equals m. Okay, so that's the result. It's uh, so so for the proof, we're going to use a technique. It should be a little bit surprising and a bit confusing if you see it for the first time, but it's a very powerful technique. Okay, so it's as follows. Okay, so beta. Okay. So so beta is an element of F P par m. You will have uh, suppose 
suppose degree of m beta of x equals d it's some d m beta of x is a is a is a minimal polynomial for beta in a free parent and it has some degree d okay i know that this guy is actually a irreducible polynomial over over uh over z p right you know it's a irreducible polynomial over z p okay so so what do we want to say now Okay, so now if I okay, so the so, so so the wording can be done real slick fast. I just want to make sure I don't uh, uh, I don't skip over something. Okay, so now what I can do is I can construct the field. x by of uh, x equals m beta of x okay so what i'm going to take is i'm going to take uh, the the polynomial so so i have a field construction method right so the point is okay so how will you say d divides m Yeah, yeah. So I haven't proved that. Right? I'm, I'm going to prove it. I'll prove it. So eventually, that is also true. Yeah. So, but I have to show z equal to m. So it's a bit more twisted here. We'll come to it. There are, there are multiple ways of proving it. The reason I'm proving it this way is it gives you a flavor of these proofs, and it's, it's a nice way of thinking about it. So, okay. So we're going to construct the field with pi of x equals m beta of x. So some other field, let's say. Okay. So it seems like it's some other field. So let's say we construct construct this field. Okay. So, how many elements? Okay, so so the first thing we know is d is less than or equal to m. Okay, so that's true. So now I want to show that d has to be greater than or equal to m. And how do I do that? So that's the thing which I'm that's the thing I'm struggling with here. Well, it's very nicely quickly finish this. It looks like the So, so, so you construct the field with pi of x equals m beta of x, and uh, that's going to have how many elements? Okay, so let's say this field is f. Okay, size of f is going to be equal to p pi of b, right? So it's going to have p pi of b elements. Okay, and there's a way to argue that p pi b will have to be at least greater than or equal to p pi m because beta is primitive. So I'm just getting confused by that. I don't know why. Okay, so okay, so okay, so 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 this field. Okay, so beta is the root of the sum beta of x. So, so, so you have to say that this field will contain beta. Okay, so that's the that's the main idea. So this field will be a subfield of this original field, and it will contain beta. Okay, so that's the main uh, notion here. So you can think of f uh, as a subfield of f beta m, and it contains beta. Okay, so that's the that's the crucial idea. I think it's. Uh, I hope it's clear. I don't know if it's. Uh, Very clear, or if it's confusing to you. So you see, so you start with the minimal polynomial of beta, okay, and you construct the. Uh, okay, so 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 I guess I mean we can just uh, we can do it in so many different ways, but I think this is this is what's uh, this is, this is, uh, so so I think it'd be an interesting proof. But it looks like it's running into trouble and in putting it down to you very clearly. So basically, you, you you take this minimal polynomial and you construct a field. You're going to get a field with p par d elements. And this field you can think of as being contained in F T par M, and it will it will also have beta in it. Okay, so so from there you have to argue that it will have uh, P par D has to be greater than or equal to P par M. Okay, so that's the 
that's a crucial idea but I'm thinking why why I'm struggling so hard with this so so here so if size of f is theta d I know that beta power d power d minus 1 is going to be equal to uh, 1 okay and then from there since beta is primitive you should be able to say Uh, D has to be greater than or equal to M. Okay, so I'm that we close the proof, but but hopefully this this logic was maybe not very confusing. Okay, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's this, this proof is not very clear. I'll come back and try to fix it a little bit later. But this is how the proof goes. Okay, so you have to think about this a little bit. So so if if you have a primitive element in this field, it will have a minimal polynomial, and then you construct a field which has that minimal polynomial as the irreducible polynomial pi of x. Okay. And then you have to argue that every element in this new field will also can be also thought of as being being in F P parent. Okay, so if you think about it, it's, it's the same thing. So you so you take you take a root of this minimal polynomial, associate it with the beta that you have in your F P parent, and then you look at all the polynomials in beta of degree less than or equal to d. It will have the same. It you can map it one to one to an element in F P parent. Okay, so clear. So think about this. So so you have you have a root for this pi of x in your F. So you, you will have you can obey the same rules as an FP param. Okay. So you so you can map this field S into this FP param as a subfield. Okay. And then you say beta has to belong to this subfield in FP param, and then it has degree P par D minus one, and that beta is primitive in that ordinal way. So D has to be at least as greater than my, or greater than equal to n. Okay. So that's how we prove it. It's a bit abstract and I know if you haven't seen it, it may not be very convincing to you. And I didn't go through the steps one by one, but that's the idea. Okay. So it's similar to the way in which we showed that ZP is contained in this field F. Okay, so we started with one and then we showed that there's an isomorphic copy of ZP inside this F right. So you do the same thing here. So you construct the field with the minimal polynomial of beta. Okay, and then you do a one-to-one -one mapping from this field to the polynomials involving beta in the original S. Okay, and then that has to have at least P par M elements. Here you have P par D elements. So D has to be greater than that. Okay. Is that, is that good enough or you want me to go into the dirty details here? Is it okay? Okay, so so when I say contains, it should be like in an isomorphic copy. So, so let me let me maybe go through it, okay? So let's say power of x is set to be m beta of x. Okay, so you got you got beta from f p power n. Okay, and you have power of x to be m beta of x. So maybe power of x is something like uh, let's say 0 plus so 1 x plus 1 till a d minus 1 x bar d minus 1. So that's our uh, degree d, no? So a d x. Okay, so let's say. These are power sets. Okay, so if I construct a field, uh, if I construct a field f with this, it would be, uh, okay, so maybe I should use some other notation here, sorry for it. Okay, so if I construct a field, Okay, maybe we'll use alpha here. Right? And then I'm going to say pi of alpha of 0. Okay, so this is the field that I constructed here, right? So then I have to kind of argue that if I take, see, alpha is such that pi of alpha is 0, right? Okay. So I have to kind of map this alpha in F to the beta in uh, FP P par M. Okay. So this is my kind of isomorphism. Okay. So let's say this is the isomorphism I'm talking about. Okay. So you take the alpha in F and map it to the beta in FP par M. So what does that mean? So if I do alpha square in F, what will I map it to? B square in F P par. Okay. So in general, every polynomial here, O zero plus O one alpha plus O one till A T minus one alpha B minus one will be mapped to what? The same A zero plus one, but then every alpha will become beta. Okay. Plus one till A B minus one beta power B minus one. Okay. So this will be in F P par. So this way you will have an isomorphic copy of F in S P par. Okay. 
Is that okay? All right. So beta specifically is an F parm. Alpha is also an F. Uh, an F. Okay. But I know beta is a primitive element of F P parm. Okay. So F in in this subfield in F P parm in the isomorphic copy in F P parm, I have at least P parm elements. Okay. So likewise, in this side also I should have P parm elements. Okay. So B has to be at least as big as one. That is the idea. Okay, so first you make this isomorphism. It's a bit uh, confusing, but well, it's very formal. But hopefully, it's reasonably clear. So, is the question clear? So, you're saying beta is contained in F. The reason why I say it's not contained, it's, it's just there's an isomorphic copy that of F inside F P param, and beta will be there. Okay, so that's the idea. The reason, the crucial idea is pi of alpha is zero, right? So, so you have pi of beta is also zero. So, a good thing is addition will also multiplication will also properly obey. Okay, so if I take two elements here and multiply, I'm going to set pi of alpha to be zero. But if I do it here in F P par M, what will happen? You will get some term, but I know pi of beta is zero in F P par M also. So I can do the modular reduction. I will get something inside here. So it's a perfect isomorphism. It's a nice isomorphism that. Way. Okay, but what do I know about this guy? Size is greater than or equal to P par M. Okay. There are at least P par M elements of this form, okay? Because beta is there, so beta square is there, beta par three is there, so on till beta par P par M minus one is there, and also clearly zero is also there, okay? So P par M guys are there in this, okay? So that means this size also is greater than or equal to P par M. So in fact, this size you can say is equal to, but doesn't matter. Okay, so it's greater than or equal to P par M. Here also it's P par M. So what is the size of S? P par D, so P par D has to be greater than or equal to P par M, and D is greater than or equal to M. Okay, so it's a bit of an abstract proof, and the reason why I did it is to just to show you an abstract proof. Okay, so how these abstract proofs work? If you've never seen these things before, it seems a bit crazy, but it makes makes a perfect sense. You think about it very carefully. So, so when when people use words like contains beta, you should be very careful. So usually people don't use that word very loosely in algebra. They'll, they'll be very careful about what they mean. But since this is true, we can we can just loosely say it contains beta. Okay. All right. So 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 there's also other powerful statements in this proof, which you should remember. Okay. So 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 we said elements of F P par M are roots of X par P par M minus X. Okay. Now you also have minimal polynomials, and so that also some strange results are true. If you have a irreducible polynomial, let's say binary irreducible polynomial. And if you have a root for it in some field, okay, the field that you construct with this irreducible polynomial is also fully contained in that field. Okay, so that's the other powerful statement here, okay, and that's used again and again in various abstract proofs in finite fields. Okay, so if you have a minimal polynomial, okay, for some element in some finite field, okay, some big field, then you construct the field. With that minimal polynomial as your irreducible polynomial, that entire field is contained inside this abstract field, and that is a powerful notion that is used in many abstract proofs. Okay, so we use that over and over again to prove a lot of simple statements. And uh, I mean, usually in my error control coding class, I keep such abstractness to a minimum because it's mostly not needed and strictly needed in error control coding. But anyway, I mean, for many of you, this might be your first real course in algebra, so so it might be a good idea to see some of these ideas and see how. Some structure which is very abstract is, is broken down into something very nice and specific. Okay, so that's, that's, that's an opportunity you don't get too much. Okay, so we'll stop here for today. It's been it's been very abstract notion. Okay, so what I'm going to do real quick, maybe in the next class, is to take a specific example of this and show you how it works. Out. Okay, so I'll take a very simple example, maybe like a fate or something, and we'll construct the field, find a minimal polynomial, and then construct some other field with it. Then I'll show you how this both of them are really Pretty much the same. So we'll do that next. Uh, yeah. So I guess here it is more like homomorphism or something.